You see it probably in a lot of other countries, like in the U.S. It's known as EFT. I, again, it was it was just creating a, a network, to, you know, sort of more modern exchange of data between the banks in order to basically provision the account to account transfer. And then the idea is that as, as funds move bank to bank, they need to settle it. We've laid the landscape of sort of what transfers are relative to scale and time and reconciliation. So how does retail payments, I guess, solve any of these, wh whatever problems might exist, or just improve on things, or just a better technology? So the real-time payments rail is is really designed to move money between accounts in a real-time fashion. Like the Lynx platform, it will also have a liquidity-backed solution that's backed by the central bank. You know, basically going to facilitate transactions. From this industry is still a really big challenge, and it's it tends to be very responsive. It's not as probably not as proactive as people would, would think it is. The key thing is what we would be doing for fraud in the middle would be assisting the banks. We would not be doing anything that would stop or disrupt payment flows. First, let me introduce you. This is Craig Boroswick. Uh, this is the director of enterprise architecture at Payments Canada. Payments Canada, as the name sounds, uh, is the is sort of the organ underlying organization and uh, manages all the payments within Canada. Uh, and I love you, Craig, to talk a little bit more about what Payments Canada does, and, and I guess in greater detail uh, to explain to the audience uh, what you do. Yeah, uh, Payments Canada provides um, the interbank account to account transfer rails. So we have uh, AFT, uh, which is a file exchange process between the banks to uh, exchange payments and replaces a, an old magnetic tape uh, shipping model that was that was used before. Uh, and then there's a a batch uh, tabulated version of that for lower priority payments. So <clears throat> we basically just stack the exchanges together, do a tabulation, and at the end of the day, we settle between the banks. And then for uh, for high value, we have uh, our Lynx platform, which uh, for transactions bank to bank that are over fifty thousand uh, dollars, they go through the, the Lynx platform, and it's also connected to the Swift banking system. So uh, the international banking transactions usually tra traverse that rail as well. And at the moment, we're in the midst of building the real-time payments rail, uh, working with both Interac and uh, Vocalink Mastercard. Okay, uh, so I'd like to go through each of them uh, one by one just to get a better understanding of them. Uh, you know how they work and and why they work the way they do. Um, so I guess the one that I guess is most familiar to most people uh, is the me uh, when I looked at a message type, which is I think Swift. So that's the one that most people use for for wire transfers. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, so Swift has a, a specialized messaging set for doing um, the the bank to bank transfers, uh, and it's it's currently called the MT um, message transfer uh, protocol. <laughs> so there's a and there's a newer version. So the the banking system is in the process of kind of modernizing and transitioning to the next generation of the message set, which is now called the uh, MX. Uh, message set. So we're going from message transfer to message exchange <laughs> uh, in the naming title. But uh, the, the new message set is uh, ISO 20022 compliant. And so it's got, um, it's, a, it's a bigger message. There's a lot more fields, more information around um, both the, the sender and the receiver of funds. Um, so it's, it's a much more robust uh, transactional capability and it will help banks better evaluate um, if um, the beneficiary of, of funds is, is, you know, if there's potentially illegal activity uh, going on or known uh, active um, issues with, with the accounts or the account holders of the receivers and the senders. So hopefully this will uh, broaden our ability to, uh, to battle some fraud in the system as well. If we if we go back a little bit and talk about the two different types, MT and MX, you you said, hey, look, there MX has a little bit more information, and the, and that way we can, you know, I guess a little bit more metadata, and that allows us a better understanding of of the uh, of the sort of I guess the information that comes in clearly. But um, if we you know sort of go back to MT, uh, is there something structural there that? Uh, is different from MX apart from, you know, there's, there's more data to find with MX, but is there something structural in the way that information that's sent where MX is a bit more secure? Uh, is there, you know, can you talk a little bit about that or is that, is that the right direction basically? Yeah. I mean, so both, both of them come from, you know, ISO based uh, standards. So there are standard message formats for uh, both sets of messages uh, and then, you know, very specific details 
around uh, the content that goes into each of those fields. And that way, as we move from, you know, a banking system in one country to a banking system in another country where maybe they label things slightly different, um, the assistance with ISO 20022 and the broader fields that are available is that um, there's better definitions and, and uh, data dictionary content around what each of those fields are for and what's supposed to go in there. Um, so there's a better international understanding of the, the different data that's being exchanged. That way they can better match where it belongs in their banking systems <clears throat> and also better understand uh, codes and the error codes that are used internationally. Right. And, and that does that impl that just sort of implicitly improves the security as well, simply because there's more information. So the, the, the security of, of Swift and, and how they encrypt messages and, and all those things that's kind of separate from the, from the, the actual messages themselves. I think it's, um, it's, it's more about that ro ro more robust data um, content that just basically allows uh, both the sender and receiver to do uh, deeper analytics on who, who's involved in the payment, right? So things like ultimate beneficiaries and other sorts of details are, in, are included. So, and, and all of the steps to get from one account to another. Uh, so all of the banks that are involved are included now uh, in the message, whereas in a number of cases they would pass through a message, uh, you wouldn't necessarily know that they potentially handled the message. So all of those things are covered in the MX message set. So it's almost like uh, you're setting up in the message, there's almost like a paper trail. So there's no, there isn't an opportunity for, um, you know, bad actors to, you know, to fake anything essentially. And that's, that's where the security comes from. Okay. Part of it. Fair enough. So is there, um, sort of, is there a limit to that? Is there, or I guess, is there, is there sort of a limit to how many banks or how many institutions, um, um, you know, sort of something can pass through. So therefore there is a limit to, uh, what the size of the message will need to be, or is it, does it sort of like, let's say it passes through every single bank in the world. Is that possible with MX? I would assume it would be possible if, if every bank had to touch a particular payment message and then it would it would certainly stack all the details uh, into that message because each one is kind of appended a, as an independent document to the header. So, I mean, it, yeah, it would be possible. It would be a crazy payment. It would be, it would be a crazy payment. <laughs> Obviously. Yeah. Um, but, you know, to, typically there's anywhere between six and ten banks involved in, uh, in international transactions. Um, you know, typically with domestic, uh, even in a domestic payment, there could be up to four banks because we have direct participants and then indirect participants on links. So for the most part, there's probably up to four banks for a domestic payment. If, if it's going between two indirect banks with two different direct clearers on, on links. So, uh, let's talk a little bit about the, I think, AFT payment processing, automatic funds transfer. So could you explain what that is to the audience? You let them, uh, sort of get a, a context of that. Yeah, absolutely. So it's really just, uh, so we have a, we have a private network and we allow the banks to exchange, uh, files with each other. And, you know, back, back in the old days, they used to ship magnetic tapes for the mainframes between each other. And so now we have this kind of automated file transfer and it, it just provisions account to account, uh, transactions between the banks. Is there something unique about AFT that, um, is this just a sort of a standard that grew out of, um, that grew out of sort of the ecosystem, or is there something unique about AFT that's specific to banks that other ways of transferring information, um, you know, sort of can't be can't facilitate? Yeah, I think you would, you see it probably in a lot of other countries. Like in the U.S., it's known as EFT. Um, so a, again, it was it was just creating a, a networked, uh, you know, sort of more modern exchange of data between the banks uh, in order to basically provision the account to, uh, to account transfers, right? And then, and then the idea is that, um, you know, as, as funds move bank to bank, they, they need to settle it. And that's kind of what the, the uh, automated clearing and settlement system does, the ACSS. So as they pass all these files together, the values that are exchanged are kind of tabulated over the course of the day. And then that way, um, you know, if, if one bank received a whole bunch of money, then, you know, they would, they are potentially owed, you know, actual money in order to cover the the funds that are being put into accounts, right? <laughs> um, so we would, we would subtract any funds that went back to that bank, and then decide how much money needs to be settled between the two, and we do that every day. Uh, and from my understanding, is this you know this bank to bank transfer? I guess the difference between this and wire transfers is the bank to bank transfer, uh, or I guess the 
the AFT transfers, they are for the banks or they are for customers of the banks? Yeah, so it's it's used by the banks to facilitate account transfers between banks. Yeah, um, so there's there's different mechanisms and different bank services that have different fees and costs. Uh, so typically, a wire transfer happens if it's if it's a larger value, and that's and that's where you know the SWIFT network comes in is is typically involved in in a in a wire transfer service, and that's usually why it's very expensive to do it. And also, typically, if you're doing international transfers, you have to do a wire transfer because it's uh, um, the systems that we use for domestic transactions are not available for, for international. SWIFT does international and the AFT does domestic and for smaller quantities. And there's just, there's a higher frequency with AFT. So it, it handles that and batches them with ACS and, and resolves them at the end of the day or some sort of period. Yeah, at, at the end of each day, we determine what the settlement requirements are for the banks to uh, basically even out their books, <laughs> right? And of course, in the old days, somebody would have actually had to like walk money between the banks in order to complete the settlement process. And now we have other mechanisms for that as well. So yeah, hence every uh, every movie with uh, every uh, every heist movie ever, basically. Yep, when people were robbing trains, it was it was probably because banks were trying to move money between each other across the country. Yeah, so they would usually send gold because that was you know kind of the smallest, heaviest thing to to move bank to bank uh, to to create the settlements. But yeah, that's that was how they would sort of meet their obligations when it was a bank to bank transfer. That would have been a fun time. They were way easier when everybody's with one bank <laughs> because then you don't have to do all of the settlement pieces of it, right? It's like, oh, put it from this account to that account. Right. No and once you start moving stuff bank to bank, they like to make sure that they have the money on hand that they tell their customers that they have on hand, right? And then it's uh, a little bit different. Uh, game. It must have been interesting work for Payment Canada in those days. It's a whole different uh, skill set. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, what's interesting is that uh, we, we do still have uh, a number of employees that have, you know, sort of 20 plus year tenure with the company uh, that have some great stories on, you know, building some of these rails originally getting started and, and just, you know, how, how the business worked, you know, even the days before we had email and, and, and other sorts of things to creating these networks. Yeah. So we talked about smaller, uh, high frequency transactions, larger sort of transactions, um, you know, between people, between banks, cross borders. Um, so can you talk a little bit about uh, LVTS, uh, irrevocable irrevocable wire transfers. Um, could you talk a little bit about that, what that does for banks and, and, and customers and things of that nature? Yeah, so, uh, so LVTS, which was the large value transaction system is what we replaced with the new Lynx platform. So it was, uh, Lynx, Lynx was an old uh, mainframe uh, based application that ran probably uh, doing that job for about 25 years. And then uh, what we did is we moved, we moved to uh, a more modern, um, RTGS platform, which is, uh, operates in a, in a distributed model. So it's a lot of virtual machines and Oracle databases and, and stuff still has the interfaces into Swift. And, and again, any transactions, um, you know, sort of over $50,000 tra traverse, uh, the Lynx platform now. So just to get it right for myself, LVTS turn into Lynx, uh, and then turn into RG RTGS. So the RTGS is, is the core of what does all of the accounting for, for the settlement. So it's, a, it's called a real-time growth settlement platform. So changing out, it's, it's you know, some advanced business rules. Uh, it's it's going to be easier for us to, to onboard more direct participants. Um, there's, you know, some, some legal legislative things that are happening that will, uh, you know, potentially open access uh, to um, more of our rails. So, you know, when we talk about uh, the Lynx platform and, and even with ACSS, there's there's maybe only about 20 odd banks, you know, 15 to 20 banks that work directly with those platforms. All the rest of the banks in Canada operate as indirects. And part of that is because there's a, a minimum volume requirement <clears throat> in order to uh, work on our rails directly. And so what we're hoping to do is over the next year or so is you know, Department of Finance and Department of Justice work on on the wording and the legislation, and it works its way through through the parliamentary system. Is that uh, we're hoping to lower the bar that we uh, we open uh, the systems to much more direct participation, uh, so a lot more banks will qualify to become direct participants on links and ACSS, and um, and then that will also roll into as we as we bring the real time payment system to the platform. It should be open. Uh, to a lot more banks, as well as fintechs and paytechs in Canada, to be able to work directly with the real-time payments rail. Um, so, what's the incentive for keeping links on, or what was the original incentive for increasing or for keeping 
links, transfers, very large sums. Is that is, is it a limitation of technology or a limitation of the legislation? Uh, no, I, I think it's it's a specific uh, difference in the way that it operates. So in the lower uh, in the higher volume, low tra lower value transaction systems, there's a lot of things going back and forth, and then the clearing and settlement happens, and there's like a square off at the end of the day. Um, with links, it it actually operates with um, central bank liquidity accounts, and that's that's part of the the barrier to entry to be a direct <laughs> participant on on the links platform is that you have to be a bank with a central bank account, and then you you basically post. Uh, a value of liquidity, say it's, you know, $5 million, $10 million. So you're kind of tying up some funds with the central bank to have posted liquidity. And then essentially with the large value transactions that are going back and forth, um, money, money doesn't physically move anymore between the banks. What we do is we just massage debt with the central bank on the back side of the system. And then everything's fine when we do the square off at the end of each day. And, and that's how they do the, the balancing. So it's, it's a liquidity-backed balancing system, uh, whereas the the other systems don't have that same liquidity capability. So basically, it, it's doing what the um, it's doing what I think it was the uh, AFT system is doing, but uh, from because of the scale, is doing it at the central bank level. Does that make sense? So the the AFT and ACSS platform don't have a liquidity backing right now. So they. Um, they, they, do, they do transactions in order to balance things off at the end right. of the day. But that's happening in, within the bank, but what, but with, with the, within the bank, but with the link system, it's happening, um, it's happening, uh, through the central bank, but the, the principle is the same. It's, uh, it's similar. Yeah. I think, you know, the, the difference is that as, as the liquidity gets out of shape, the, the, they have the opportunity to borrow from the bank. So from the central bank. <clears throat> So the central bank can basically provide more liquidity if there's a if there's a large imbalance of funds transacting between two banks, right? So the the bank that is coming up short can borrow more liquidity from the central bank at, at a you know whatever the agreed interest rate is or current interest rate, and then in the in the square off settlement they would uh, find a way to pay that money back to the central bank. But essentially, it makes sure that the funds are transferred between banks without. Uh, disrupting the payment transactions themselves. It's just uh, it's a it's, it's a more managed uh, central bank managed uh, method of settling between the banks by having them commit funds and be able to borrow funds from the central bank. You said um, in order to be able to use the system, you have to actually have an account with the central bank, and you're saying you're trying to open that up. You know, so there are more people who can use the system, and there's legislation to make that happen. So is that legislation? realistically just to allow other actors who have smaller sums to be able to open accounts at the central bank to be able to leverage this mechanism then that's sort of why that has to go through legislation and the other part is the uh, the volume commitment right so there there is a minimum volume requirement to be a direct participant as well and and basically we're we're taking down that uh, that volume requirement so even even if a bank has a central bank account they have liquidity sitting there even if they're doing you know, a hundred transactions a day instead of a thousand transactions a day, they can still qualify uh, to participate on the rail as a direct participant. Is there an incentive for um, what, what's the incentive to make that ha to, to you know open up that system? Um, yeah, I guess for I, I would say for smaller actors to they'll be able to um, be able to resolve uh, you know sort of transfers and they'll get that sort of backing from the central bank if things aren't uh, they don't have enough right and so I think that's that's good. For, I guess that's good for them and then it democratizes their level of access and it probably reduces costs for them because they have to use, they don't have to use an intermediary bank, but is there some, you know, sort of, is that something else or is that, okay, go ahead. Yeah. It's a uh, speed of transaction. Uh, it's, it's definitely easier and faster to get a transaction direct to direct than to go from an indirect to a direct to another direct and then back to an indirect if you're going between two smaller banks. And then also, yeah, then there's the, the fees involved because obviously there is, you know, processing uh, fees for the indirect participants to go through the direct. Is there something that Payments Canada, is, is that something that Payments Canada wants as well? Is there, is there something that it makes things easier for them on their side? So, I mean, it, <clears throat> it, it uh, probably becomes a bit more work for, for us because as we add more participants, there's obviously, uh, you know, there's more customers that we have to manage directly, uh, more relationships that we need to maintain because, uh, you know, we have, we have to 
sort of work and, and drive consensus with uh, with the entire group of participants in order to make changes, updates, you know, things with the message sets that uh, that happen, uh, making, a, you know, changing a field from being an optional field to being a required field. We need to go out and, and make sure that everybody's on side with that, that, you know, systems on all sides and payments hubs on all the participants are able to, to do those things. So obviously it's gonna, you know, make it a little bit more challenging for us, but again, it's it's also about making a more efficient you know payments infrastructure for Canada. So it's sort of have to balance it off. <laughs> and as we get to real time payments, it'll be interesting to see how you know a lot of the ecosystem changes because um, you know the, obviously there's going to be a ceiling limit for the for the real time payments. Um, it may be a combination of of payments that go over the current rails that shift to moving in in real time because. You can move money in real time. Why not move it in real time? <laughs> so, um, it is so you know over time it'll be interesting to see how some of the volumes change and maybe how a lot of things may shift towards uh, the real time payments rail when it comes available next year. So, can you talk about the real time payments rail? You've alluded to it quite a bit, and it seems to be a, a, a big push, big incentive for you guys. So, can you talk a little bit about that, what it does, and how it because you know we've laid the landscape of sort of what transfers are relative to scale and time and, and uh, reconciliation. So how does retail payments, I guess, solve any of these, whatever problems might exist or just improve on things or just a better technology? Yeah, so the so the real time payments rail is is really designed to move money um, between accounts in in a in a real time fashion, and it's <clears throat> like the Links platform. It will also have a, a, lo a liquidity backed solution that's backed by the central bank, and that and that way it's it's you know basically going to facilitate transactions, and you know if we look at maybe a cap of about 75,000 to 100,000 the idea is that this this is a timer driven uh platform so if if there's a reason that it can't complete uh a transaction or account to count transfer within 5 seconds 5 to 8 seconds uh basically that that payment will fail and it will get undone and you would you would essentially have to retry that payment um or you know you know we would have to figure out in we're sitting in the middle so we'd have to figure out why you know, payments would start failing. Uh, but yeah, it's so, you know, today uh, with, with Interact, you know, we have services like eTransfer and uh, there's there's no timers on eTransfer. So if, if something flags a payment, uh, you know, it could take two minutes, five minutes, it could take up to a half hour if, if a bank decides that they need to investigate why um, an eTransfer is, is being made if they think that there's something suspicious going on. Um, so they're not they're not locked into timers. In a lot of cases, you know, any transfer will go through, um, you know, within a, a minute or two. In, in a lot of cases, but you know, still, if if you're looking at using an e-transfer mechanism in order to pay for your latte uh, at the corner coffee shop, you know, hanging out for two minutes while you wait for it to to clear and get the notification so you can walk away with your cold latte isn't great. So, um, <clears throat> so with real time payments, it should be more instantaneous in in the same way that uh, that debit is is instantaneous, uh, but more it, it'll be more direct bank to bank. And then the the expectation is, uh, in, you know, in in combination with rule changes and other things that are going on, uh, that you know fintechs and paytechs in, within Canada will have much easier access to use the real time payments rail. It will not be just locked down to, uh, you know, the biggest banks with the highest volumes to be direct participants. Right. So you know, you talked a little bit about e transfers and banks investigating concerns with with the transfers for. Um, you know, for, for bad actors, generally speaking. So uh, with real-time payments, I'm sort I'm assuming that, uh, or, or the real-time rail, I'm assuming that's something that you guys are concerned about. So how does that system uh, mitigate against that if it's so quick? You know, as it is today with, with a lot of our existing rails and, you know, sort of the same model kind of persists in real-time rails, um, you, you'll find that the, the liability sits with uh, the bank, <laughs> the banks themselves. Uh, but you know, they're, they're also limited in view in what they get from an analytics and a scoring perspective because they only operate within their four walls. They don't necessarily have the analytics and the details of, uh, you know, fraud activity at other banks, uh, unless they've seen it or if it's being shared by banks. There, there is some sharing, limited sharing of, of details of, of bad actors, uh, and, and potentially bad accounts between banks, but it's, it's not, you know, as robust. Um, but you know, one one of the areas that we are looking at incorporating in the real time payments rail is something that is doing uh, some support analytics in the middle. 
right, of the network and feeding that back so that that can complement what the banks are doing with their own internal systems. They'll get a network score that they can balance off with their internal score. And then um, they'll have to do sort of a quick decision on whether or not they're going to allow uh, the payment based on that combination of score or not. In some cases, there's, you know, and, and I think, you know, the big challenge in the industry with fraud is that it does tend to be a bit of a lag, right? So you start to notice a few things that look a little bit funny, and then you start pointing at some stuff, and then, you know, you might get in front of it in time that you can contact, uh, you know, another institution and maybe put a hold on funds or do something before somebody, you know, does, does initiates the next steps of basically, you know, emptying a mule account or, you know, transacting stuff out of a country. Um so it's it's still uh, yeah like fr fraud in this industry is still a really big challenge and it's it tends to be very responsive it's not as uh, you know probably not as proactive as people would would think it is <laughs> um, but you know in general it's it's like oh well all of a sudden we're seeing a whole bunch of twenty five dollar transactions going to one count this is potentially somebody you know fueling a scam through text messages or or email. And so then people kind of have to look at it and then they probably put a lock on the target account if they can and other things. But yeah, it's, it's not, it's not as instantaneous and reactive as you want. And, you know, obviously the, the key thing is what we would be doing for fraud in the middle would be assisting the banks. We would not be doing anything that would stop or, or disrupt payment flows through, through our platform, right? Because again, the liabilities does sit squarely with, with both the sending and the receiving banks. But you are helping them with that network score, which I'd love to get into a little bit. So how is that sort of generated? Because I mean, if they're relying on this and you guys have that sort of like uh, bird's eye view that they don't have. So, uh, you know, it, it'd be great to hear sort of how you guys are giving them some sort of, uh, you know, some sense of, you know, the value or the, of this transaction from a security point of view. Yeah. And, and I think that's where, um, you know, it's, it's a combination of uh, pro providing a, a network scoring that goes along with their internal bank scoring and understanding like reasons why our scoring might be higher or lower on a transaction. And then also um, that aggregate transaction view of seeing all of the transactions going from multiple banks and potentially seeing like a lot of, particular payment flows to a specific target right. account. And that's how that score is sort of generated. And which you wouldn't be as easily, yeah, which you wouldn't see as easily within one bank, right? It's like, oh, maybe I've got four or five guys sending $25 to an account. But when we see 20 banks with 20 people each sending $25 to, you know, what what could be flagged as a, as a mule account, then, you know, we have a better uh, ability to kind of set a flag back to those banks to to start checking into those payments. And certainly the target account, they we can we can definitely hopefully get a hold on that target account while it's investigated um, before, you know, the money moves to somewhere outside of the ecosystem where we can't potentially put a lock on it, right? So uh, from what I'm getting is the network score is basically, you know, a, a mix of the amount and whether it's consi a consistent amount or within its consistent range. And then how many, from how many places is this amount coming from? Um, you know, uh, and, and then also where is it going? Yeah. And I'm, I'm using one, one specific scam model in, in my example, right? But obviously there's, there's a variety of different uh, things that square and frame, uh, you know, potential fraud, uh, things that are going on. And, um, you know, there's also a variety of, uh, you also have to take into account that there's a variety of other rails that are potentially, uh, in, involved, right? So, cause it could include credit cards, it could include, uh, debit transactions. And so there may be other transactions that feed into a real time transaction. And by combining stores from a variety of different networks and potentially correlating transactions across networks, and that's another conversation, but, you know, obviously being able to look at a broad scale, time scale analytics across transactions on all of the rails within Canada can make it easier to find um, more complicated fraud activity, potentially human trafficking activity and other sorts of things just because of the, uh, uh, you know, a particular mix of transactions that may be coming and going right. with, with specific actors on, on the, on the networks. Yeah. All right. So multiple, multiple model. It gets a lot more complicated. No, it sounds like it. We have a fraud department. Yeah. That, and a separate person that, that does all that stuff. I'm not. I'm not the expert right. on the fraud side, no, so I'm. I'm keeping it very simple examples that <laughs> I know we can potentially uh, have an impact on, and and that's uh, that's where we. No, but it's informative. You know, I think you know multiple models and, and multiple ways in which people sort of try and beat the system, and and it's good to to hear how you guys are sort of 
taking all of those into consideration and, and, and the different ways in which and how difficult it is to do, right? Yeah, and, and the key is like we're we're still a year plus from you know, probably from launching the real time rail. And yet, you know, we've got people on the ground, you know, working with the banks and, and looking at some of this stuff because we know like when it comes to bad actors in the system, they are already opening accounts, you know, building credit scores and doing stuff specifically in, you know, to prepare for the availability of this rail to basically look at how they can thwart the scoring and and get at least you know a run of transactions going through in real time to collect money and then do the follow on steps right so that's that's why we have uh, we already have people that are working it's a competitive uh, sort of uh, it's it's a mechanism of com competition for sure and and reaction so absolutely and then you know we also have the input because other countries have already gone live with real time payments such as the UK the EU um, in the U.S., uh, the Clearinghouse has real-time payments, plus uh, they're going to be launching uh, FedNow with the Federal Reserve Bank uh, later this year. Australia has their uh, NTP uh, real-time payments platform. So we're also, you know, in concert understanding some of the challenges that they're working through uh, as well. Just, you know, in, in general from, from payments and participants, as well as the fraud piece and, and a variety of other things. So we have... A lot of input that we sort of have to take in <laughs> and balance out how we, you know, it comes down to how we set our rules and our policies, how we manage the platform, how we add features like fraud and, and other things to to help support and protect uh, the rail operationally. Is there a standard for inter international cooperation for these uh, for these sorts of concerns to like? Um, where, hey, we've implemented this stuff already and therefore here's information about it? Or is this just something within the industry where you take, um, it's just sort of, it permeates through? And then I, I, I don't know that there's necessarily a, a standard sure. for that. I think, you know, we, we, we willingly come together. I mean, we're, we're kind of all in the same boat with, within our own countries. Bilaterally, we have conversations and obviously, you know, the next step, uh, you know, once all of us have real-time rails in market, you know, the next step is how, how do we facilitate cross-border real-time interactions between these real-time rails? So, you know, how, how are we going to get uh, an RTR payment into FedNow or from FedNow into RTR? So we're, we're in those conversations as well. And, and we're all open to sharing and, and kind of helping each other because, you know, for the countries that are already in market with real-time payments, uh, they're seeing a lot of similar challenges. And so different countries have different ideas and different mechanisms for how they, they solve for some of those problems. And, and obviously sharing on that stuff uh, only makes us stronger in helping to respond to, to some of the issues that come up. And as, as we're getting closer to being in market with our own, um, yeah, we've, it's, it's been very open dialogue with, with the current operators and also looking at what we might try <clears throat> to facilitate the cross-border transaction capabilities in the future. One question for me is, is how does RTR, uh, real-time transfer, how does that affect the rest of the mechanisms you talked about before, SWIFT, uh, ACS, uh, links, and, you know, do they become obsolete as a consequence of this, um, of this solution or, um, you know, almost obsolete by definition? Obviously, you're not going to cut it off and turn it off immediately, but is the idea for it to become obsolete? Yeah. And, and obviously that's going to come down to, um, beh behaviors of, you know, the, the people sending money. So it'll be consumers and, and businesses and the way that they uh, work to transact with each other. Um, you know, Canada, Canada still operates a, a fairly heavy volume of checks. <laughs> you know, there's still people getting paid by checks instead of, you know, um, electronic, uh, transfers. Um, there's a lot of business to business transactions that happen via check. Uh, you know, most of the real estate industry for, um, you know, buying and selling real estate is, is, uh, bank drafts being exchanged between, you know, realtors and, and, uh, and agents. So a lot of those rails kind of pick up pieces of that. And, and I think, uh, you know, e-transfer, uh, you know, sort of added another mechanism, especially, uh, targeted at kind of the person to person transfers, uh, and as well as person to business transfers. For a lot of things, um, you know, the, the real time ra rail will take over interacts e transfer for business. So that e transfer for business solution that's already in play will be directly uh, working with, with the RTR. So a lot of that volume is going to come that way. Um, so, but a lot of it's going to be a change in behaviors. Some of it may be changes in the way that banking is delivering. Um, deliver services and, and offer services to customers to be able to move money. Um, 
so there's a lot of opportunity and, and you're right you know when you if you say we'll allow transactions up to a hundred thousand dollars on the real-time rail we we know that there's a good chunk of traffic going through the links platform in that fifty thousand to a hundred thousand dollar range that could shift into the rtr so, but, uh, you know, the, and again, the, the, you know, the real-time rail is going to be domestic only. So for a lot of those international transactions, you're still going to need a swift uh, mechanism to, to move money out of the country and from out of the country into the country. So that will continue, that channel will continue uh, for now. And then, you know, again, as, as we build more connections between our real-time platform with, with other countries, um, yeah, you, you'll probably see a sea change in the, in the way that volumes go against the different, uh, the different rails for sure. So, but it's it's still all Payments Canada volume at the end of the day. It's just which rail it's going into and, and the fee structure around, uh, you know, the payments that traverse it, right? So it's just uh, volumes to volume. We're just right. shifting it into different rails. <laughs> no, no, fair enough. And, uh, yeah. you know, you know, talking about fee structure, is there, you know, can we talk about what retail rails fee structure is? Is there an optimization for, for users as well on that for them? I'm not on the product side, right. so I'm not as deeply knowledgeable in what, on what the fees are for, for the different rails and transfer right. mechanisms. So I'm probably not the, the best person to comment. Fair on. enough. Um, so now, you know, I'd love to move into like how, you know, this, you know, all these different sort of, uh, I think we've, we provided a lot of acronyms for people to, to sit on top of, but uh, I think. Yeah, I'm sure people are Googling <laughs> like crazy. Yeah, no, for sure. But, uh, you know, I think there's also for a certain segment of people, I think they'd love to know how this sort of, uh, is possible. And there's quite a lot of, uh, we've talked, said a lot about volume. And if there is a lot of volume, there's a lot of technology involved in making all this possible. Uh, uh there seems to be, uh, and it has to work. It seems like it would be nice for it to work a hundred percent of the time. I think most people would be, would be, uh, enthusiastic to hear that it does. Um, I think in, with all technology is tough to make that true, but, uh, as the uh, as the director of enterprise architecture, it seems that it sits on you to to make that as true as possible, and it's a tough tough thing to make happen. So I'd love to hear about how uh, sort of your ideas are permeating through and, and making sure that all the systems work one hundred percent, you know, as much as that's possible. You know, the bulk of my job is really just trying to make sure that we do a lot of things consistently. You know, that we have established patterns that we follow, especially when it comes to interconnectivity between the banks and our rails. Um, you know, we've we've been augmenting a lot of our systems to offer APIs. So, you know, application interfaces in a, in a RESTful model that is is a it's a new interface model, and it's it's been a bit of a slow uptake uh, for the industry. Like a lot of the things that we operate on uh, are queue based still. So we use like MQ series as as a, you know, a core mechanism to move messages and so transitioning over to apis even for things as simple as just doing uh, reconciliation reports via api uh, and other pieces has been slow on the uptake but we've been working on providing a lot of those things and then with uh, with the real-time rail it is going it's going in market as a as a 100 api driven platform so and that's that's kind of a new and different push you you look at um you know, R RTP in the US uh, and even FedNow is going in market as an MQ queued uh, solution, mess queued message solution. Um, and I believe Faster Payments was, because uh, was, Faster Payments in the UK is, is almost a decade old, but I think they've been operating at uh, uh, mostly queue based and they're offering APIs now. And now it's, it's in that kind of transition as part of their open banking mandates to move people to more API based solutions instead of the old queue styles. But it's it's part of the it's part of the challenge because obviously a lot of these old banking systems that the banks are running uh, know how to do queuing really really well, <laughs> uh, and you know and, and a lot of the old banking platforms still operate in in mainframe big iron style delivery right so getting stuff in and out of those machines via queues is way easier than uh, trying to build API clients in uh, COBOL. So so how are you wrapping this stuff in in APIs in the first place then that you. I'm assuming there's some intermediary systems that allow you to, to make this happen. And then sort of, there's two questions. First that, and the second also is, you know, how you, how does, how does that, how do your systems handle scale? Um, because I mean, I'm sure there's a, there's quite a lot of volume as you've spoken about before. And there's quite a lot of uh, up and down when it comes to, you know, what time the volumes happen and things like that. So could you talk about like sort of like how, how your architecture is, uh, um, managing all that? 
you know, obviously in a queuing architecture, it's easy to handle volume because everything just kind of piles up and then you just kind of chew through it as fast as you can. Um, and, uh, you know, in, in the in, in the distributed computing world, it's a little bit easier to basically spin up some extra machines, whether it's virtual machines or, um, you know, in, in a containerized model, you can basically spin up more and more containers to basically start chewing through that content faster. Um, and, and obviously, you know, even in the API model, there's there's a bit of queuing uh, that goes on as well. And in the more, more modern application design and the way that we're doing delivery with real-time payments, we have uh, that ability to basically scale uh, elastically based on the volume that's coming and going uh, through through the rail. Uh, are you manage, are you managing all that server load internally? Is that something that like do you have people? Uh, I guess the, you know managing the boxes inside and things of that nature, or you're using external services to to do the scaling for you? Yeah, a lot, a lot of it's working through external services. That uh, so we have system integrators that we work with that basically host and operate uh, the platform themselves. We do the the business, so we're interacting with kind of the business layer of the platforms and a lot of the technical delivery is handled through some of our service partners um but it, it's you know it's, it's in the technical design so when the products that come from the vendors are designed to be scalable and whether you know it's it's uh, rapidly adding virtual machines or rapidly adding containers and then destroying those things as volumes go down those those things are kind of built into um the operational design of the platforms that uh, that we build well, thanks you. Thanks you for walking, uh, walking us through all that. That's quite a bit there. And, uh, I guess now I kind of want to switch all the way, uh, or segue through from that still to a little bit of technology conversations, but more uh, around Bitcoin and, and sort of how that, uh, or I guess like, uh, you know, cryptocurrencies and how that affects, uh, payment Canada's, uh, payment Canada's future and that's sort of the future of financial transactions in general. So, um, could you sort of give us, uh, First of all, your understanding of uh, of cryptocurrency from your perspective, you know. You know, I came to uh, Payments Canada. I had fairly wide involvement <laughs> with uh, with sort of crypto and and DeFi and some of the activities there. Um, my prior my prior job, uh, so coming to Cap, uh, to Payments Canada, I was wor originally working for Capco, and I was uh, the North American lead for their global blockchain practice. So, implementation of blockchain for different uh, use cases in the banking system, as well as understanding crypto, central bank di digital currencies, DeFi, Web three, uh, metaverse. We we were working on you know a variety of those topics with different banks uh, around the world in my previous role, and so. I think you know we, we don't um, we don't get as impacted necessarily on on the cryptocurrency front. Obviously, it's it's still uh, kind of in the infancy of of a lot of uh, traditional banks uh, offering digital asset uh, type capabilities, whether it's you know cryptocurrencies or um, other digital assets, you know whether it's NFTs or other sorts of things, right? So that's you know a, a rapidly up and coming service capability that I think a lot of banks are offering. I, I'm, I'm not seeing that um, there's going to be a lot of interfaces coming to the rails that we offer to provide, you know, sort of a, a mix of traditional currency and, and cryptocurrency type capabilities. Um, we, we certainly don't see a, a lot of that on our horizon. Uh, but I think, you know, when we when we switch gears to what we see with central bank digital currencies, and obviously, you know, Canada has been, uh, you know, front and center in the conversation around, you know, using blockchain and use cases for, uh, different types of settlement models and uh, central bank digital currencies um, and, and different mechanisms there. Like they've had projects going on since uh, probably 2016 uh, with Project Jasper, where they've been looking at examples of how some of this stuff works. Um, obviously, a lot of that research is, is ongoing. Uh, there's active uh, projects and collaboration between the G7 and the G20 countries to look at um, models, delivery, delivery models and mechanisms of, of central bank digital currencies. I think, you know, from, from a Canada perspective, Bank of Canada has stated that they expect a coexistence. So if, if they do choose or reach a point and they've, they've sort of stated that there are three, three specific reasons that they would decide, um, that they would need to, that they would have to launch a central bank digital currency. Although I think, uh, you know, as, as more and more countries look at launching central bank digital currencies, it'll just become one of those imperatives. Every, everybody needs to have one. <laughs> um, but, you know, they, they basically said that they expect central bank digital currencies to live alongside the existing fiat model for quite a while. And so that 
that has a direct impact on us because it means that, you know, on top of having um, the current capabilities of doing account to account transfers, we will also need to be potentially be able to facilitate account to wallet and wallet to account transfers for central bank digital currencies. And that could, you know, that capability could be leveraged further um, to support cryptocurrencies and decentralized finance if that also continues to be to grow in in popularity and if, and more and more services are offered in that space so so it'll be kind of those two things and the growth of those two things in in combination and how it impacts the existing you know kind of banking system and banking services that are offered in canada where you know we may need to look at enhancing our systems to be able to support that uh, that wallet functionality um, in the future. One thing I want to ask is, uh, you know, what exactly is central bank uh, digital currency from the bank's point of view? So how do they see that? You know, we have Bitcoin, we have Ethereum, we have all these sort of technologies that sort of, you know, act in various ways and for various reasons. So what is what is the central uh, central bank digital currency? How is that going to act for banks? And, you know, uh, sort of what did they how do they see it being used? Uh, you know, it's it's not to pay for things. It's not to what is it going to be for, right? So you know what I mean. It's yeah. So it's it's a good question. Uh, you're you're right, and, and I'm not sure that there's there's a, a lot of great vision of, of how they expect people to necessarily use it, but they're they're looking at how they can augment and complement, you know, what we do with with fiat currency today in in a in a more digital model. For a central bank digital currency, and you know, sort of the key difference between a, a cryptocurrency and a central bank digital currency is that a central bank digital currency is centrally operated. Um, so, you know, the central bank will own all of the controls and, and operational um, parameters of, of that currency, how it's issued, how it's destroyed, how it's used, um, and they have the full transactional visit visibility of the activity with that currency, right? So they, they would have much deeper reporting and understanding of sort of different economic activities that are going on, things that are popular versus not popular in, in the way that people spend. Uh, and, and there's a lot of great things that you can do with those analytics, but being able to do that analytics is one of the things that kind of freaks people Fair out, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, and then, you know, in, in contrast, you know, cryptocurrency is, is decentralized. There really isn't a controller. They exist and, and kind of persist based on, you know, the, the contributions of a, of a very large number of people across a lot of countries um, that, uh, that make those, th those capabilities work. Um, so it's just, it's a very different operating model. And um, I think, you know, as as we see more countries go in market, and obviously we have a, only a handful of countries with central bank digital currencies that are that are in market. I think we'll we'll start to see where you know some of the possibilities and the advantages are, uh, especially from a you know sort of a more macroeconomic view of what uh, you know a central bank could potentially do in in influencing an economy and and the economics of a country both inside and how it's viewed outside. Uh, of the country itself. So today, you know, you know, we, we need to fight inflation and, and really the, the central bank has one lever, right? And, and it's, it's interest rates. So as, uh, as inflation, as inflate, yeah, exactly. And as inflation rises, the interest rate rises because they think that that's the only mechanism that they have really to, the, to, to kind of cool things down, even though, you know, in, in the current climate and the current inflation uh, run, there are, you know, a variety of other factors between supply chain and, and a bunch of other things that are just having a lot of trouble resolving themselves, you know, sort of post pandemic. Um, you know, it is quite possible that there there could become additional le levers uh, in, in the way that um, a central bank can control uh, the valuation of currency internationally and uh, and to deal with things like other factors relating to inflation and other economic conditions. Uh, through a central bank digital currency. Well, uh, well, Craig, thank you very much for coming on the program. Uh, if you don't mind, could you tell the audience where they can find you? Uh, where they can find me at Payments Canada or online? <laughs> well, I mean, if they want to go to your office, that's one thing. But if they could find you, if there's a much safer method, probably online would be great. Yeah, uh, no, I think uh, probably the easiest way is to connect with me uh, on LinkedIn. So you can search my name on LinkedIn. I'm, I am the only Craig Bursowich there. Guaranteed. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining the program. Uh, it, it was really great having you on. And thank you for all the information and uh, telling us a little bit about central bank digital currency. 
talking about all the different sort of payment transfer mechanisms that we have at different scales for different reasons. So uh, it was very informative for me and, and the little research for this was really interesting. So, so thanks so much. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for the time. I hate to go. Chat That's too. it.